This is Buffalo, What's Next? I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget J. Paul Valenza. And I'm Dave D. Boat. If ever there was an issue that demands more discussion now, the racist massacre at Topps Friendly Markets on May 14th is um, it. You know, America has a long, deep, rich history of racism brutalizing black communities. But where does it go from here? What does our community need? We must work and teach our children. What issues just aren't being addressed? As long as we keep doing the same thing, we're just sitting ducks for the next mass shoot. That's all you can say. This is a new program. Every weekday, we'll set aside this hour to hear from the community about issues that can no longer be held back. We need to make a concerted effort in our nation, in our institutions, and yes, in our family. And this is Dave Debo. Coming up later on the program, Bridget Jai Paul Valenza will be here with friend of, of, of Fragrance Harris Stanfield. She was a manager at the Tops shooting scene. Also, Jay Moran will be talking with India Walton, the former mayoral candidate. But first, here with us now, Dr. Ron Stewart, chair and professor of sociology at Buffalo State College, SUNY Buffalo State, I guess they call themselves these days. He works in their Africana Studies program as well. He's done a lot of research on the black family and young black men. And he's also someone, obviously, as a sociology professor that looks at societal problems. So for our discussion uh, this morning, we're kind of going to uh, fly above the trees, Dr. Stewart. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. What do you think is the number one social problem that we can point to after a shooting like this? Is it violence in society? Are we a violent society? Are we a racist society? Or um, I'm betting you would probably say, E, all of the above. It's a little, it's a little of, of all of them, but I think uh, racism um, permeates our society in a way that it, it drives a lot of racist people to violent behavior. And so that brings in the violence. Uh, but I think the, the what undergirds a lot of this is just racism. I mean, America has always been a violent society. I mean, the country was, was founded uh, violently in terms of f- fighting the British, uh, fighting the British, not wanting to pay taxes and stuff like that. And it was a violent revolution. And that violence continued to... Uh, be a part of our society as evident by our fixation on guns, weapons of war, if you will. And so violence, racism, uh, economic inequality, uh, there are a whole slew of uh, pathologies, if you will, that plague American society. And uh, seemingly, we don't have the political will, the moral drive to do anything about it. It's interesting that you you refer to it as a pathology, because to my mind, um, that makes it a lot more serious and perhaps, let's stick with the medical analogy, a lot harder to cure. No? Yeah, but, you know, there there are diseases that we have found cures for, polio, uh, uh, I mean, you know, and even the ones that we haven't found cures for, we can treat them because they're chronic illness in a way where people have a good quality of life. We're not treating racism and violence adequately that contributes to people who are hurt and victimized by these kinds of uh, pathologies where they would have a good quality of life, particularly people who look like me. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Uh, black people in this country uh, receive or experience a level of racial intolerance that's that's it's becoming almost uh, indescribable. Um, and, and, it, and it transcends region of the country. Uh, Malcolm X said the South is anywhere <laughs> below the Canadian border and having lived in the, at the bottom of the United States in terms of being a native of Mobile, Alabama, and now at the top of the United States in terms of a resident for over 30 years in Buffalo, New York, I can truly attest to the pervasiveness of racism throughout this country. We've done interviews with you in the past where you've described 
some of the letters that you, as a black man in Buffalo, have received when you moved to town. Um, yeah, that letter. It's, it's everywhere, I guess you would say. Yeah, you know, and that letter, that letter, you know, I think I think about that letter. I, I, I read it often because it's 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 trauma. It's a type of trauma. You know, even though it's words, you, you know, being called uh, a turd on two legs, a uh, effing n i g g e r things like that, it hit you to the core, and you don't get over it. And so I can imagine, in terms of the families of five fourteen. The families who lost members on five fourteen, uh, you know, it's a type of trauma that they'll never get over. And I don't care what you do in terms of how you treat the sickness of racism; it's going to be with them until they until until they go to the next level, if you will. So that's the individual trauma. What about the community? What what can be done in that regard? Well, how you can treat the community? Yeah. Well, I if, think, if that I, is even possible, but go ahead. Well, well, I think you know, you know, I think our society has a way of of treating of treating uh, black people uh, a certain way in terms of appeasement. Uh, you know, I think about the civil rights uh, the Civil Rights Act that was passed in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, that was a form of appeasement. You know, when you, when you, when you saw little girls being uh, blown up in the church and, and, and canines and water holes being sick on people in the city of Birmingham, you know, it was it was it was appalling. It was abhorrent. And so what did the government do? They appeased them with the Civil Rights Act. They appeased them with the Voting Rights Act. When you saw all of the protests related to the George Foreman killing, they appeased them with the Juneteenth holiday. And there's a lot of appeasement going on on the east side now in terms of feeding, feeding the community. Thoughts and prayers. And as well as thoughts and prayers. But, you know, but they had multiple supermarkets yeah. on the east side other than the, the, the iconic Tops Market, the one iconic Tops Market. Then, you know, it, people would have somewhere to go other than all of these what I like to refer to as missionary groups coming in to feed people and. I don't get it. It's it, it, it's it's you know I, I I I I'm 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 very cautious in what I say because I don't want to, you know, disrespect uh, the people who lost their lives. But but I've driven past that area now twice, and I, I'll just I'll just keep my my personal <laughs> comments to myself because I don't I don't want to I don't want any backlash. Then, I don't want to be disrespectful. But I, I just you know don't bring food trucks. You know, bring infrastructure build up, you know, bring better schools, bring jobs. You know, I rode when I was uh, third last Thursday, I rode through that community. It was about noon because I had dropped some clothes off at Hobson Cleaners over on Delavan. And I, and I, and I came up to Jefferson. And I, and I said, let me go. Sure. And then I made a right turn. I think it might have been on Northampton or somewhere in that area. Uh, Riley It was on, actually on Riley. And I'm driving up riding, it's about noon, noon, and I saw so many young black males, like, sitting on stoops and, you know, walking the streets. And I'm saying, where, where are the jobs for these people? So bring jobs to young black men. Bring better education. Bring better housing. You know, those are the kinds of things. Bring better health care. I mean, if you look at that report that was done by Dr. Taylor, uh, last fall called Hen- Holiday Run. Henry Lewis Taylor at UB. Yes. Right. Called the Holiday Run. One of the things that he talked about was the premature deaths of blacks on the east side. And he talked about uh, the, you know, the the uh, the large number of uh, low birth weight babies and, and the high infant mortality rate. I mean, if you want to if you want to cure the pathologies that plague the black community on the east side. Those are the kinds of things that you need to be bringing. Better health care, access to better health care, adequate health care, access to good education, access to uh, affordable housing. Those are the kinds of things that I like to see and not a food truck. As nice as, as well intentioned as that may be. Yeah, as, sure. well as, as well intentioned as that may be. Talk to me, though, about uh, I see a scenario and maybe I'm wrong here. Uh, tell me if I am, please. Um, you cure some of those little problems. You play whack-a-mole. You get rid of housing. 
uh, issues. You get rid of uh, segregation issues. You get rid of education issues. You get rid of health disparity. I'm guessing, and again, tell me if my premise is wrong, that all of those things spring from racism. And unless you eradicate the racism, they're still going to be there with all of your best efforts. No? I think until we, you know, I, I'm really, it might in some sense be rhetorical because I think it's, it's an Im, impossibility in this country to get rid of racism. So what we got to do, we got to find you, you really believe that, that, that this can never change? Listen, listen. Okay. W.B. Du Bois in 1903 yeah. wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folks. And he said the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And here we are 103 years away from that. And racism led to some young 18-year-old racist driving hundreds of miles to come here and shoot elderly people in the face. You know what I mean? To, to blow people's face off. It's 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 entrenched. It's it's uh, it's 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 sustained. Racism benefits certain people, and in this case, I think it benefits whites. Period. Yeah. And so it's not going anywhere because whites like the benefits that they receive. And so, you know, we can try. What what I was about to say, I, I, I want to get sociological on. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there was a study done. Before you do, let me just interrupt. If folks are just joining us, Dr. Ron Stewart is the chair and a professor of sociology at SUNY Buffalo State. Uh, he focuses a lot of his research on the uh, economic and social conditions uh, confronting African-American males in society. And uh, obviously, we are talking a little bit about uh, the situation on the east side in wake of the top shooting. You know, you know, what I was going to say, that was a study called the Roberts Cave Experiment. And it was done by a social psychologist by the name of Musafar Sharif. And basically, what, what he did, he had these groups that were competing against each other. And the competition was fierce. Uh, he, 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 brought, he brought the two groups in. They didn't know each other. And then he created this competition, like a tug of war and stuff like that. And they became very competitive. And what he wanted to do was to reduce that competition and that conflict between the two groups. So, like, in sociology, we talk about reducing racism in terms of three different ways, our prejudice and racism, contact, mm -hmm. education, and the social media. But what his study fa proved or uh, uh, demonstrated was that contact alone does not get rid of racism. There needs to be some mutual interdependence between the groups. We need to be fighting for the same thing. And if we fight for the same thing, then we can reduce some of the racism. And, you know, I was thinking about what 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 should we all be concerned about? Uh, two things that come to mind immediately is nuclear annihilation and, and, and global warming. You know, if 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 we all understand that, you know, we could be as racist as we want to be. But if we don't save this planet and we don't prevent nuclear annihilation. And the reason why I'm mentioning nuclear annihilation is because we're hearing it, a lot of it since the uh, and, Russian and Ukrainian war. And you're saying it could be a shared goal. It could be a shared Survival goal. Survival of the planet is for the entire planet, be they right, right. black or white matter. or right. red, what have you. And there may be some more uh, limited kinds of national kinds of things that's uh, particular to the U.S., but that's what we need to try to find, where we can bring it together. But by the same token, you know, Racist people, <laughs> you know, they, they they tend to perpetuate their racism from generation to generation to generation to generation. So but 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 I think there's hope in terms of a cure for the pathology of racism. If we could identify what 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 Sharif referred to as a superordinate goal that transcends what you want. In need and trans as a white person and transcends what I want and need as as a black person and, and make it mutually beneficial for both of us. I'm surprised to hear you say that that you don't picture a generational solution. I think of my children and my nieces and nephews, and they're far less racist than their common grandmother, my mom. Generationally, the the, the dial has moved. No. Well, Dylan Roof. Was twenty one? Okay. Peyton Gendrum is eighteen. 18. Yeah. Okay. So you, you tell me, like I, you know, and I don't think that they are 
uh, aberrations. I think and when you go back to the stop the what was the thing in, in Virginia with 2017 with the march, uh, Frederick Vert. Yeah, those uh, I forgot what it, that was. Charlottesville, great. Virginia. Yes, right. thank you very much. Right. Those were young white the guys. The one where President Trump said right. there's with good the, on both sides. Right, with the sure. ticket torches, with the with the ticket torches and, and and the khaki pants on. Yeah, those were young white guys, mostly for the most part. And the one that ran his his Charger, Dodge Charger, which is my favorite car, <laughs> I'm on my third <laughs> one. Uh, you know, r- you know, he drove his Dodge Charger into the crowd and killed that, that young woman. Yeah. Uh, he was a young white male from Ohio, I think. So it, 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 it transcends generations, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, speaking of young people, you know, I do think that young people do have the potential to, to, to put a dent in, into the, the, you know, the armor of racism. If they get out and they vote some of these politicians out who, 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 who don't care anything about society in terms of their politics and how they vote. They put power over principles and stuff like that. Those people need to be voted out. And and I'd like to see young people in our society the way the young people did in Birmingham during the civil rights movement. You know, the young black kids who were marching, they were at school and they escaped out of the out of the windows in their schools because they tried to lock them in yeah. to go and march and go to jail. You know, the young people doing the uh, the, the, the uh, hippie movement, you know, the young whites who were fighting for rights for college students and stuff like that. You know, young people can make a difference. Are the youth of today energized in the same way? I don't think they are as privy to what's going on because they're too uh, uh, connected to uh, social media. And they too concerned about Instagram posts and Snapchat and Facebook and a slew of other kinds of social media platforms that they employ uh, on hours. Mm. They need to become more politically savvy, more civic engaged, and more politically active. And if, if, we can, if we can get some political activity among all of these young people, like the school what, the, in, in Florida, the park. Parkland, Parkland, think, right? You know, those were young high schoolers. Yeah. You know, the, if we took all the young high schoolers in this country and they became galvanized and mobilized and registered to vote, they can make a difference as it relates to gun violence, violence that's killing a lot of a lot of their peers. I know you focus a lot of your work on youth. I want to just before we close here briefly touch on the elderly. Though you had a Facebook post in the wake of the shooting that um, pulled together the data. The people who were shot were 86, 77, 72, 67, 65, 62, 55, 53, 52. Youngest was 32. Right. And the median age for that uh, sample was 63.5. So in this particular case, the community lost its elders. Yes, we lost one of the most vulnerable groups in our community. There are two vulnerable groups in, 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 in any community. Uh, young people, young children, and the elderly. And and when you have, uh, 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 what do you, I'm trying to think of a word for racism because it's so vile. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you have a demonic uh, uh, issue that can uh, allow a young guy to come and shoot elderly people in the face. And then it's just, it's, 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 it, you know, it's, it's just, I, you know, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it because I'm, those were my elders in terms yeah. of the average age. That's, I'm right in there. You know what I mean? And, and I just feel like when, when you got something that will force someone to come and shoot you in the face and blow your face off, I just think it's, we, we are, we're really a sick society and nobody plans to do anything about it. And when we lose the elders, that's a base of knowledge. Absolutely. That can help the community. Absolutely. You know, I watched uh, the elderly woman's funeral, Miss Whitfield, I think, uh, and I watched her husband. He sat in the wheelchair, and they rolled him to the front. And then I, and then I, I was listening to Al Sharpton uh, on uh, uh, the radio. The, yeah, uh, the, NBC. Uh, the memorial service, the, right. No, not, no, no, this was like a couple of days after on his program on W. On WNBC. Okay. And he talked about how he sat there and looked at her husband 
Michael, she used to go and, uh, you know, shave and, 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 and love, if you will, because that was her husband. So she used to go and be loving towards her husband. And he said he just, he, it was just so powerful to see that image. And so this young guy who took that away from him, took his wife, took that loving away from him. It's just sad, man. We, America ought to be ashamed of itself. You know, America prides itself on being number one. So right now we're number one in gun violence. Uh, we're number one in racial hatred. We're number one in LGBT intolerance, uh, LGBTQ intolerance. We're number one in, 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 in how we don't take care of our children. You know, we get Olympic gold for all of this stuff that we ought to eschew, ought not have anything to do with, but we get Olympic gold for it. Dr. Stewart, we've got to have you back. We're out of time, and, and we, 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 you've raised so many issues that we need to touch again. But I appreciate the fact you were able to uh, share the time today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Dr. Ronald Stewart is... Uh, Ronnie. The, Ronnie Stewart. Ron. Or, okay. Ronnie not Ronald. Or, we Ron, won't call you Ronald. Ronnie or Ron, not Ronald. All right. Ron Stewart is the chair and sociology professor at SUNY Buffalo State College. Stay with us. More to come. It's one thing to love public media, but it's a special thing to support it. Consider this. If you've got a car you don't need anymore, or you've got one that's simply too expensive to repair, arrange to donate it to Buffalo Toronto Public Media. It's easy for you. Pickup is free, and it could be worth hundreds of dollars in support. Here's how to get started. Go to WNED.org slash vehicles. Watch, listen, engage, play, and learn with Buffalo Toronto Public Media Stations and our weekly newsletter, The List. Sign up to receive the email at WNED.org and find out the best shows to watch, the great music to listen to, the important news you can't miss, and the many ways you can engage with our public media family. Sign up now at WNED.org. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. Hello, you're listening to Buffalo What's Next. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. Imagine going about your workday, making your way through your normal routine, doing the tasks that you have to do, being annoyed by that thing your coworker does that makes your eyes roll, and suddenly the unthinkable happens. That's how May 14th went for my guest today, Fragrance Harris Stanfield, the manager on duty when the bullets started flying through tops. Fragrance, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for having me. How, how are you? I am okay today. Uh, day by day. Day by day, minute by minute, mm -hmm. sometimes hour by hour. That's right. Um... Tell me about the supermarket. Well, first off, I'm not the manager on duty. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. I didn't read that part. Um, I am the uh, customer service lead. Okay. So I was in charge of the front end at the time. So, yes, I was a supervisor for the front end on duty, uh, but not like the manager of the whole store at the time. So Got it. just want to make sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, it, it's more than just a grocery store, though. It's it's It was a gathering place. Tell, tell me about that. Is, that. that is very true. Um, we have a lot of regulars who come to our store and family members of those regulars who come from out of town and shop at our store. Um, but it is about, I think, four miles from the next nearest tops. So um, most of the tops are like within two miles of each other. So uh, this one is kind of in its own area and uh, kind of what you would call a food desert. So it brings a lot of people in for that reason, but of course they stay for other reasons. We have conversations about our day, about our families, about what's going on. People from out of town tell us why they're here and, you know, things like that. So it's really like a community meeting place of sorts, and um, it would be nice if we had a community space in our store to be able to sit and talk and meet and things like that, because it really 
really does serve that purpose for our community. Now, you aren't the only person in your family who works at that top? I am not. Uh, my daughter works there. She's 20. Um, she had just come back from maternity leave um, that week. Um, I, my son-in-law also works there, and his brother also works there. So um, there are a lot of family groups who work there, so it's it's a very family-oriented environment. Definitely. It seems so. Take me through part of your day on May 14th. Um the good part of the day <laughs> so the, the day was normal <laughs> um, started out just regular doing our job I think I had come off of break went back into the break room to put my phone in my locker so after the incident of course no one could contact me and find out how I was pretty devastating because both of my phones were locked in my locker um but I had just cashed out one of our regulars who usually sits outside on the bench, Grady. Um, and you've probably seen accounts from him on lots of social media networks about his experience because he's usually sitting right outside the store where everything started. Um, but I had a stress pain that was so severe. I was turning to my daughter to tell her how painful it was. Like, what is going on? Like, I'm not stressed about anything. I'm having a good day. So what's going on? And before I could tell her what was going on, that's when um, we heard shots being fired. So. I can't even imagine. What, what did you do? I mean, what were you thinking at that point? I... I can't tell you uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly, but I know that the first thing we did was pause. And um, it's a real concern um, that when we hear gunshots outside of the building that we're standing in, we don't immediately run. Uh, we live in communities where we hear gunshots. Um, I recall just last summer, there were 34 shots outside of my house. Um, and... I didn't run from those either. You know, you right. hear stuff all the time. If it's not coming for you, you know, you don't know that you need to do anything. And certainly you're standing at, in the middle of tops at work. You really don't think this is coming for you. Absolutely not. We've heard gunshots before. We look towards the front door. We wait a few minutes. And sadly, we go about our day if we notice that they are not coming for us. But this particular day, as everyone who was paused, because we all were on pause, customers, workers, everyone, pause. And when we saw um, Aaron Salter, which we just thank him for our lives, for those of us who made it out, um, we saw him engaged with the shooter, and that's how we knew it's time to run. Where, where do you go to find shelter? <laughs> no this. shelter. There was no shelter. You didn't really know where you were going. Um, there are um, contingencies. We had had discussions about what would happen if we had an incident in the store. But it was always if there was an incident in the store. We never discussed if something is coming in the store for us, you know, right. so that that front door is not an option. Um, we're in the front end. So... There was a second front door um, that was supposed to be our exit to get away from whatever is uh, in the store um, that could endanger our lives. Um, but since it was coming from outside, we didn't know if there was another person outside. You know, it kind of the thoughts are going really, really, really quickly. OK, so we've got offices, which one locks, you know, mm -hmm. uh, do I go on this one, this one? So I had like four options in the front end to go to. But since it was coming from the the front of the store, my um, co-worker, Morris, said, to the back, let's go to the back. And so I curved around to head to the back, um, and that's how we got out was through the back. I'm also a mom. I can't even, uh, you know, and I, I, I've said this again and again, I, I cannot imagine having my child with me 
through any of this. But your your daughter was working that day. What what she was standing right next to me. So um, it's there are so many crazy thoughts that go through your head. First of all, if you're running for your life, you're thinking about how to get out of the store or how to get safe. That's the first thing you're thinking. And although I was standing next to her and I grabbed her arm, when she pulled away, I didn't think she pulled to stand there. I had no idea. You know, you would think she's pulling her arm. She's going to get her momentum and she's right behind me. And, you know, going back over the events, it's like there are points when I probably would have noticed that she wasn't there. I got knocked to the side into a pallet of boxes. I got knocked to the floor um, right at aisle 12, right near the freezers. Actually, I thought I was going to die there. I honestly did. So there are points I probably would have noticed if this was a rational situation that she wasn't behind me. But I did not realize it until I got to stop running. So when I got to the back and I'm in the back room and I look behind me and I'm looking around like, what, you know, where is she? Right. And I was just like, where's my daughter? And everybody knew who I'm talking about. I don't need to say her name. And I'm like, then I just start screaming like, where is my daughter? You know, I mean, like I really, yeah. and I try not to say that part because I really just still kind of spaz out a little bit. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, know, you yeah. can't help it. The emotion just comes back like, oh my God, to realize she's not there. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and there's nothing you can do, you know. Right. That's the worst part is... That they had to get me to be quiet. And I'm usually the calm one. So I just had to take a deep breath and calm down. Because then going through your mind, it's like, okay, so my daughter has two babies. You know, I don't know if she's still out there. I didn't feel like she was gone, you know. And obviously, I'm very in tune. You know, if I had a pain that told me something was about to go down and I didn't even know what it was. But... I didn't feel like she was gone, but at the same time, your mind had to process like every thought that every possibility. So if that's the case, if I run back on the floor, something had happened to me or she could still be alive and she could see me shot and then she could, you know, come out or cry out or, you know, so it's like I'm putting myself in this danger. I could be putting her in danger if she's still alive. And then if she's not alive, then they're going to lose their mom and their grandmother And I have younger children as well. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like all those thoughts go through your head. So you're going through all that within like a few seconds, you know, and you're thinking, how the heck are we getting out of this store? Because remember, I still wasn't out at this time at this moment. Right. You're just in just in the back in the back room. So he could still come and you hear it getting closer. So you're thinking this and then you're like, oh, my God. okay, you know, like get yourself together. Mm hmm. And it's like, how are we getting out of this door? And they were having some trouble opening the door. Then we finally got out. And it was like, you just ran, you know, and you hid. And then you heard him again. And then you ran some more right. and hid again. And after I hid the second time, I just collapsed. I couldn't. It's like, I can't run anymore because I don't know where she is. And that just keeps coming back. Every time you pause, it's like that thought comes back. Where's my daughter? Oh, my God. Is she still alive? Has anybody seen her? We're looking up and down the street with people running everywhere. And I'm looking through crowd and, you know. And that that mama bear instinct to go and try. And I still went back in the building. Yeah. I really did. And it wasn't just me. It was like three of us went back in the building like, come on, let's go look for her. How, you know. how were you reunited with her? Well, the police stopped me from going back in. Let me tell you that. Um, first, my co-workers, um, they were like, you can't go back on the floor. We don't know what's out there. And then um, the police came and escorted us out the door back out to the back so um, I didn't find out until uh, one of the managers the operations manager she said she's over here and I'm just like just ran and we had SWAT who was trying to keep us like it contained in an area just ran past them like <laughs> listen <laughs> this is my child <laughs> this is my daughter we're talking about yeah, okay exactly <laughs> I think I crashed into her like we just crashed into each other uh-huh. You would have thought one of us was going to fall down and the other just fall on top. But we um, we just embraced each other. So happy. She said she felt the same way. Like, she's like, where is my mom? You know, yeah. has anyone seen my mom? So how uh, how is she doing right now? Um, she's OK. 
Um, her days are a little tougher than mine. Yeah. Um, she was in the store the whole time. So if you can imagine hearing bodies drop yeah. and hearing every shot that was shot. Um, and he walked past her twice. It's just the grace of God. It's the, the grace of God that that I got off the floor. It's the grace of God that he did not see my daughter. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, the two of us are meant to be here. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I'm here talking right now. Like, this life is not going to be in vain. Not that I was ever, you know, one of those people before. I'm a very intentional person, but increased intention, if you want to say so. You know, but she is really dealing with just daily life. And life wasn't easy for her anyway. She's 20. She has two babies. Um, and although she has a support network, it's, it, it's just not easy. It wasn't You know easy the world before. we live in. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. You're listening to Buffalo What's Next. We're talking with Fragrance Harris Stanfield, who was in Tops on May 14th. Um... Fragrance, what, if anything, do you say to the people who believe racism doesn't exist or or that the black community makes it worse by talking about it? Hmm. Interesting question. <clears throat> I would say social constructs like racism exist because people are still on this planet who feel that one race is superior to another. Race itself doesn't have to exist. It's a social construct as well. Like we're all human beings. We all have interchangeable organs and, you know, parts, honestly, if you want to think about it that way. It's unbelievable to me to think that another human being would think any less of me, you know, than I would think of them like we're the same, you know, we were, you know, crafted onto different parts of the world and that causes some people to be melanated and some people not to be, you know, and it's just a survival thing. God made us so incredibly wonderful that our bodies can adapt and change based on our environment and, because of these adaptations, we have a problem with one another. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, I don't subscribe to the thought that any one group as a whole thinks a certain way. So that goes for black people as well as any other group of people. I, I think it's an individual thing. Um, but black people definitely don't make it worse. We're not making this up. And I think May 14th kind of showed that we're not, you know, we're not crazy. (laughs) Um, This man, who I will not name, came to our community because he wanted to kill black people, period. And it gets kind of lost in the story and what's being covered um, is that he came to kill black people. He didn't just come to a grocery store to shoot people. He said specifically he wanted to kill as many black people as possible. That is not something that we can make up. Thank you, Fragrance Harris Stanfield, for sharing your time with us, for sharing just this incredible story of survival with us. Um, We appreciate you, and we are so glad you are here. Thank you. I'm host Bridget Jaipal Valenza. Up next is Jay Moran with political activist, nurse, and former Buffalo mayoral candidate, India Walton. We'll be right back. Stream the best from Buffalo Toronto Public Media's YouTube channel. If Our Water Could Talk, Erie County Fair, two Frederick Law Olmsted documentaries, and so much more to watch. The very best of WNED PBS, now available on YouTube.
Sometimes we miss our morning alarm, then we miss our morning news, and the whole day is off. That's when you can listen to the WBFO Brief Podcast to catch up on the day's news and get back on track. Find it every weekday wherever you get your podcasts, and then like and subscribe so you never miss the award-winning journalism of WBFO's news team. listening to Buffalo What's Next. There are several ways for you to join the conversation. Send us a message now on Twitter at WBFO. Email us at news at WBFO.org or just press the talk to us button on the WBFO app and leave a comment we can use on the air. We're here for you. This is Buffalo What's Next. And uh, welcome back. I'm Jay Moran. Our final segment of our show today features India Walton. India Walton is the uh, senior advisor for special projects for the Working Families Party of New York State. She's also a strategic organizer for Roots Action. But, of course, in Buffalo, we know her as the person who uh, took the political world by storm a little bit last year, uh, one year ago, as a matter of fact, winning the Democratic primary for mayor. India, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. And uh, we won't necessarily look back on that, but I'm sure you've got a lot of lessons that you learned about the political world and the way things work in Buffalo that you can impart on a discussion, which is looking forward here in Buffalo. And it's interesting. You were telling me that Roots Action, which is a, a national organization, they're, in essence, pulling or allowing you to pull back right now so you can focus on the local issues that have emerged here in the last three weeks. Yeah, the interesting thing was that as I interacted with folks who were impacted by this tragedy, they were thanking me for coming home and I never left. Um, But I've been sort of removed from local issues and local politics. So I'm looking forward to digging back in deeply to local organizing and making sure that the survivors and the East Side community as a whole gets what is due to them. Let's get into that then. What the things that are emerging right now? I mean, I'm sure in, in many ways. Nothing's changed from your east side plan from last year when you're running for mayor. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, I wonder if there's a sense of certain types of needs right now that you're hearing about that need to be addressed. There's definitely a sense of urgency and a lot of black led organizations such as Open Buffalo, as Black Love Resisting the Rust, as Feet Buffalo, as Mona House has been in a moment of triage and emergency response. And what we want to do is we want to be able to get those organizations stabilized with proper funding and capacity and be able to serve our community so that we can get at the root causes of why 85 percent of black folks live on the east side, right? And the conditions therein that um, are the result of concentrated poverty and disadvantage that results in an increased level of violence, not only community violence, but violence that is exacted on our community from outside of our community. So we really want to be in a place where we can Think about and implement true solutions and not just sort of Band-Aid, fly-by-night, shiny, popular, media-worthy solutions. While, of course, those things have been mentioned for sure, one of the things that I've taken from a lot of these conversations that we've had and we've heard from other people, there is a, a certain resilience that we're seeing from the black community here in Buffalo and Obviously, there's a lot of anger, but it seems like that anger is is being somewhat pushed under to beyond. Let's get to the issues instead of Mm -hmm. being mad, because being mad would be totally understandable. Right. I've been black all my life (laughs) (laughs) and um, you can be both. You can be both mad, you can be angry, you can be hurt, you can be sad at the same time, and you can also experience joy, love, and care. And I think that our community are experts at that. And I have been saying that the one thing that we lack in our community is not ideas, it's not talent, it's not intelligence, it's resources. So right now we're calling for investments, deep investments in our community that will give us the resources to implement Um, some of the initiatives that our thought leaders have been thinking about for a very long time. 
those initiatives, I'm sure a lot of them are public initiatives. Well, I want to ask you, though, at the same time, though, again, you had that experience as your time is looked like you could have been mayor of the city. It was <laughs> looked like it was going to happen for sure. So you probably had to take into a lot of accounts private investment as well. Are there private investment opportunities and I guess can you see a marriage of private investment in some of these initiatives that you're talking about? I can see a marriage of private investment and um, one, you know, the the Community Reinvestment Act officers at M&T Bank, I think, do a pretty good job of keeping their ear to the ground, of engaging people who are doing the work at the grassroots level. But there's a lot more work to be done. But I think that there is a great potential. And as long as we are keeping community at the forefront of it, bring community members to the table. I have always said the people know what we want, where we live. We know what we want. We know what we need. And we are great implementers. There's no one who's going to work a budget better than a single mom. <laughs> so bring us bring us to the table. Let us share our ideas and, and take community people who do this work seriously. And most certainly we've been seeing and uh, talking to some of them on this program here in the last uh, week or so, which has been enlightening, uh, to say the least. So let's talk about then some of those things that you're hearing from people. And again, there are probably some are very large. Some are probably a little bit smaller. Give me some examples of, of initiatives that boy, if we could do this right now in X amount of time, we would have this in place. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a lot of conversations about food deserts, which um, in the food justice movement, we prefer to call food apartheid. Right. These are intentional policy decisions where certain neighborhoods do not have food available. Um, it's interesting that uh, on Twitter earlier, a person said, well, there's another grocery store within three miles. And I said, well, have you ever tried to walk groceries for a family of four? Three miles home. <laughs> um, three miles is not close to a grocery store, especially when a third of the people don't have access to a car and public transit is an issue. But I think that, you know, we've been working for many years trying to get the African Heritage Food Co-op up and running. There's a brick and mortar on Carlton Street in the Fruit Belt neighborhood, which is very close to where the shooting on, on Jefferson happened. There's also the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust that is um, building affordable housing for ownership for residents of that neighborhood. And I think that, you know, aside from food, we need to focus on creating affordable opportunities for home ownership. Um, we need to think about upward mobility in job creation. It's not enough to give a person an entry level position, but how does that person then move up through the socioeconomic ladder in order to have a stable life so that we're not always in a position of scarcity and of housing precarity? Um, talking about you know universal health care and canceling student debt and all of these things that we know benefit all of us, but particularly black folks and people of color in our communities who have disproportionately suffered from consumer debt, from medical debt, from student debt, and from being locked out of traditional financing for home ownership and for small business entrepreneurship. When I met you last week uh, over at Carlton Street uh, at the uh, future site of the African Heritage uh, Food Co-op, uh, co um, you brought up the, the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust. And in, in, in saying you know, this is shows you what can be done in a neighborhood. Take me through it. What does it mean to, to have that in place? And the, the follow up question, which will be, can we be doing that in other neighborhoods in the city? Yeah, the the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust was sort of how I cut my organizing teeth. It was my first job as a nonprofit executive where um, I learned a lot about board composition, about relationship building, and about how you fundraise money to get the thing done that you want to do. But it was also proof that a person who was not a developer um could in fact develop affordable housing. I'm a nurse, right? But I believe that safe, affordable, healthy housing is the foundation of a healthy life. You can't have self-actualization and autonomy without the basics and the basic of 
movement in our social stratosphere comes first through housing. Um, so I do believe that it can be duplicated in other areas of the city. Um, actually, two years ago, I believe, the Land Trust amended its bylaws to be able to serve other neighborhoods who are in desire of that type of model of affordable housing for ownership and community building. And I also believe that the city has a responsibility to help <laughs> to be of assistance to make land disposition and vacant property disposition policies that prioritize nonprofits that are trying to put properties back to productive use and that prioritize black and brown people, working class people and people who have been blocked out of the traditional housing markets to be able to have some sort of stability and wealth building opportunity for their own families. Is the city dragging its feet on these issues? They have been, and they usually do. Um, you know, from my experience, the city has wanted to um, dispose of property and land to the highest bidder. And we know that nonprofits and affordable housing agencies don't necessarily have the resources to be the highest bidder, right. but they're trying to just do good for the community. And I think that um, that should count. And actually, we have opinions from the attorney general and multiple attorneys that say that if the disposition is going to serve a public good, then the city can dispose of property at below market value. And we need to be looking more into what that look like, look what that looks like, how that feels and how we can prioritize people over profits in the city of Buffalo. I like when you say what that looks like, because it's another nice theme that's been kind of developing at a low level here. Imagining a different Buffalo, mm -hmm. one where we have neighborhoods where we all want to be part of, walk through. I, I'm, I'm just spending time at the uh, over on Carlton Street the other day thinking, you know, this could be a, a destination for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you know, not just the, the people in the fruit belt, but it'd just be a great place to walk and to be part of. I mean, do you see that in other parts of the city? I mean, do you have other visions like that? I do. I've spent a lot of time in my life thinking about what the Buffalo that I love looks and feels like when we come together and when we value each individual for the contributions they have. And, you know, 13,000 people visit the medical campus every day, whether they're working or whether they're patients. And... They want to go get fresh produce yep. and they could get it from right on Carlton Street. And that will also be an opportunity for folks who work on the medical campus or who are visiting to interact with people who are from that neighborhood. But I also think about Broadway Fillmore. I also think about, you know, the, the Bailey Kensington neighborhood. I think about a lot of neighborhoods in Buffalo that have so many people who are determined to make it into a home and make it into the best place that it could possibly be. And if we could just cooperate a little bit more, I mean, between the city council and the mayor's office and community groups, um, if we could open that process up and really consider the ideas of other people, how great the city of Buffalo would be for everyone. And we would continue to have to have conversations about redlining, about racism, about systemic oppression, but we could have them in earnest and in honesty, and we could implement solutions that are going to begin to break down those walls and barriers that we've built up around us and allow us to be a more holistic and healthy community altogether. We're talking with India Walton uh, this morning on Buffalo What's Next. Uh, India, uh, I mean, it's only been three weeks since this, I mean, this tragedy. Uh, um. Do you have a sense, I mean, you know, there's always that bitter reality that uh, leads us to be cynical, but any sense that something good can emerge from this just awful, awful incident that's going to, you know, it's going to be on the Buffalo history mm -hmm. map forever? You know, I prefer to comment on what is within my control. 
Right. I don't know what other people are going to do. And I just commented maybe yesterday that it seems that we're already pivoting from conversations about white supremacy and about systemic oppression to gun control. Both things are important. I'm not saying that gun control but, is, but is not very an issue. different, especially for Buffalo. Very different, especially from Buffalo, because these white supremacy and systemic disenfranchisement is not new to Buffalo. I've been here my whole life. I've experienced it. So I want to keep the focus on how we build up the east side, how we make deep investments in the east side of Buffalo, how we lift people out of poverty, how we improve access to education, how we improve access to living wage jobs. And I don't I don't mean through workforce development. Workforce development is cool, but that gives people entry level, low wage employment. And I want to see people in middle management in this places of decision making because we have that amount of talent and skill in our community that just has to be fostered and supported. But like I said, the part about this I can control is what I do. So um, for a lot of national foundations and organizations, I am the person from Buffalo they've been exposed to. Right. The mayor's race gave us national media attention, notoriety. So as people are reaching out to me to see how they can help, I am leading them to black led organizations who are doing work on the ground, who have been before this happened and will continue to do that now that the cameras are gone. So I just want to encourage folks um, don't let me forget you. Um, if your organization needs capacity or support or fundraising help, send me an email, please. I am at India at IndiaWalton.com. I just want to do what I can and use my platform to make sure that we're highlighting the work that's being done and make sure that we're supporting the organizations who do that work. When I uh, saw you last week and uh, said hello uh, for the first time, I said, you know, we're talking about the Working Families Party, and I said, oh, you're are you going around the state creating other India Waltons. And you said, well, I also might be creating a couple of <laughs> India Waltons here in Buffalo. Uh, well, can you tell me more about that? I mean, that, that was that caught that intrigued me for sure. I mean, are there people who want to pick up this mantle and run with you? Ideally, there are. Um, we have some key races coming up in 2023, especially in the all-male city council that um, I and other folks are particularly interested in. So um, I'm, I'm reaching out to potential candidates to help them get trained up and know what the realities of running for office in a place that as in, as um, entrenched as Buffalo is, is not an easy thing. Um in hindsight, I can say that I had some fun, but it was a very traumatic and uh, sobering experience. But I learned a lot from it. I think that I'm a very different person than I was just a year ago. And I'm looking forward to helping um, other folks find their place in the political system here, whether that means running for office or supporting someone who's running for office. So again, if there's anyone who's interested, <laughs> um, whether you want to be campaign manager or field or whatever, uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. And of course, you also found out about what it's like to organize and to get people on your team. Uh, you had some, you know, volunteer help on the local level here last year. Um, you have a good idea of how to get that rolling, huh? I do. We we won a primary election against a 16 year four term incumbent with an all volunteer staff. Right. The June win came without a single paid staff person. And that is unheard of. And I know that if we could do it once on that scale, we could do it two, three, four, five times um, in in council districts, at school board seats, on the county level. So I'm, I'm excited about the future that's to come to get some real working class champions in office that are going to listen to folks um, and that are going to co-govern, right? And when the people tell you what they want and what they need, I believe that it's the job of an elected official to represent that um, and and not decide for people what they want, um, but carry the wishes of the people they represent to the office that they sit in. And before I let you go, let's give that email address one more time, because it sounds, I bet you there are people right now who are saying, I want to contact India Walton. Please do. My email is India, my first name, at IndiaWalton.com.
India Walton, thank you very much for joining us on thank Buffalo you. What's Next. Coming up to 11 o'clock, this is member-supported WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOL and Oleon, and WUBJ Jamestown.